professor. Uh, Tom uh, received his BA degree from Antioch College, his master's in urban studies from Spurtis College. His whole life has been involved in engaging not only in the artistic realm of theater, but coupling that with engagement in the political and social realm as well. Uh, Tom has been involved with the co-founder of um, Protect Our Parks. He was the managing director of Pegasus Players from 1985 to 1990. He created the Chicago Young Playwrights Festival. Okay, there's a theme here, you notice. His theme is trying to get other people to be engaged in our uh, social and political arena as well. Um, he also helped found the Greater Chicago Citizens for the Arts. Uh, he organized the Creative American Project and went around the United States training artists and cultural workers on how to leave a civic life. Um, and uh, most recently, he was involved with No Game Chicago. Uh, first time I ever talked with him, he mentioned this and he said, you know, you know why we didn't get the Olympics? It's because of No Game Chicago. Um, his, the thrust of his entire life, again, has been a coupling of the creative artistic spirit of the theater with politics. And this is very important in uh, applying to the concept of transformation. When we attempt to create significant change that's, that is transformative change, we have to have some vision. And it's the artistic spirit that creates, this, creates one source of new vision of seeing the world in a different light. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn the podium over to uh, Tom Tresser. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Tom Tresser. And uh, in terms of outliers, I'm so far out, I come back and meet you the other end. Um, I call myself a creativity champion because I believe that uh, creativity is an American feature, part of our DNA. It's what got us uh, invented as a country. It's part of our democratic promise. It's part of what makes us prosperous. It's why 38 million people are in this country right now who were not born here. Um, and so if I had to sum it all up, it's one word called opportunity. Opportunity equals creativity equals reinvention. And America is a place where you can supposedly reinvent yourself without respect to your birth, who your daddy was, what you had for breakfast, who you sleep with, or anything. It's always supposed to be about what's up in here and what's up in here. And that's always supposed to care about. And that's, to me, what makes this country great. So that's, that's my operating principle. That's what keeps me up, that's what drives me, and it's what has been behind the various things I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, but in, in talking with uh, Professor Levinson, I was trying to, to not just tell you stories, but try to distill some lessons or rules, shall we say, guidelines, uh, to um, leave with you to um, perhaps guide you or, or be of use to you. So I'm going to tell my story with that in mind. So as I uh, tell you these stories, here's what I'd like you to keep in mind sort of above the frame. You want to ask yourself, where are you from? This, these are questions having to do with the social change work in general. Where are you from? What do you stand for? Another way to ask that, what, what gets you angry? What are you passionate about? You, if you don't know the answer to those two questions, you really can't engage in this kind of work that we're speaking of. Where do you stand? What particular issues do you stand for? And who do you stand with? Who are you, when, you, when you look to your sides, who's, who's with you? And what are your methods? At the end of the day, how do you choose to engage? Those are some of the personal questions that I would put before you. At the same time, there are organizational questions that somewhat mirror those personal reflections. So again, if you're part of an organization that's trying to engage in meaningful change, these are some of the things as an organization I believe you should be mindful of. What are you fighting for? Who and where is your base? Now, base is a term from the world of organizing that refers to your, your, your crew, your, your neighborhood, the group that you're solid with, where you're from. The organizations are folk that are going to be with you right away. That's your base. It could be your neighborhood, could be your church. But that's, your, that's how we talk about your base. What is your plan? How, how are you going to get from A to B to C to D? What is your infrastructure? Now, that's a word I really like to use. And as organizers, as his change makers, um, it's just not about you with a vision, though of course that's important. It's about building an infrastructure that will outlast you. 
and that will we'll, we'll keep going. So many of you that might be part of a nonprofit, while well, this institution, for example, Governor's uh, State University is a nonprofit institution. It will be here after you go. It will be here after the professor goes. So it's, it has infrastructure, which means funding, an organizational base, a legal base, et cetera. And as you build your nonprofits or as you work, engage in social change or as you engage in civic work, a question to ask is, where's my infrastructure? How do I make this thing go beyond me? And how will you redistribute power? Now, that's a specific question that we use in um, organizing that you don't necessarily find in other charity work or uh, work that might be about um, you know, helping people or even educational work. But when we talk about organizing and social change, at the end of the day, we need to transfer power from those that got it to those that don't got it, OK? Uh, who here has heard of Frederick Douglass? So Frederick Douglass wrote over 170 years ago, power can seize nothing without a demand. And basically, um, you may be in the right, you may have justice on your side, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything unless you have some power to have your will carried forth or to have the changes you desire made, 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 made uh, real. And so social change activists often talk about how to rebalance the power relationships in a given situation. And for example, here in this college, suppose um, you know, the food was terrible, and I'm sure it's great. But suppose it was terrible, and the, the students decided they wanted to do something about it. They would go to the cafeteria and maybe file a, a complaint in the suggestion box. That'll be ignored. So maybe they write a letter to the head of dining services. That'll probably be ignored. And at some point, and it'll, they may be ignored for perfectly sound reasons. They're too busy, uh, et cetera. But at some point, the students may get together, and they may go in mass to the person's office. They may take a petition. So in other words, you see what I'm saying? This gets a little friction. And at some point, the system goes, oh, OK, we better pay attention to these people. And it, and an accommodation is made. And when that accommodation is made, some power has shifted from them that didn't have it to those that do have it, or vice versa. You see what I'm saying? So this question about redistributing power is one that's often overlooked, but it's, it's very, very important. Basics of me, um, I was born in New York City. I came to Illinois in 1980 to be a member of the Illinois Shakespeare Festival. So I am a former Shakespearean actor and theater producer. As I say, I'm a self-styled creativity champion. I've started or led eight nonprofit organizations in the arts, community development, and civic engagement. My hobbies are politics, history, travel, volleyball, science fiction, and photography. I've been married 18 years to the marvelous Merle Green Tresser. So that's me. Just to give you a visual story, so there's me as an actor in a, in a cheesy melodrama. There's me as a producer, um, not actually in the picture, but I produced frogs in a swimming pool. We call it Chicago splash hit musical. I worked for People's Housing and created a community arts program there that combined economic development, culture, and training. That was in the early 90s. This is in the north part of Chicago. Uh, I worked as a, 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 a for-profit business called Executive Knowledge Works, uh, doing executive education, high-level knowledge interventions for Fortune 500 companies. I was in, in the internet startup world. And uh, this was, um, our, our house was Ace Hardware's online play. And we went, I think I was the 16th employee. We went up to 160 employees, burned through $110 million. And all I got to show for it is this watch. <laughs> but uh, I could have been a contender. But uh, we went out of business in 2001. But it was a wild ride. And I got to meet a, a, a lot of fabulous people and learned a lot about the online environment, which actually I use to this day. And I'm an educator. And I teach co um, classes at. DePaul, IIT, School of the Art Institute, um, on um, creativity, civic engagement, and pu public policy. So that's, that's me. Core beliefs. So I will now reveal to you, you know, kind of, I, I think I indicated one of my core beliefs about creativity. So I'll just restate them um, because I think I got to practice what I preach so you know where I'm coming from. So if my core belief number one is creativity is a national value. So you hear a lot about values in, in our political engagement, don't we? Who hears values, right? We've heard these family values, et cetera. Well, I, I propose another value to be placed on the political table called creativity. Now, um, if you think about it, 
Um, the founding of the United States of America was a profoundly creative act. Yes? You think so? Well, America was the only country that was ever um, founded as an intentional invention, not an act of uh, aggrandizement to take over someone else's land or not to um, you know, push someone out, but it was about an idea. People had uh, grievances, but they also had an idea that said, that goes something like, we the people, that, that the power to govern should be, uh, reside within the common folk. Uh, and that was a radical idea back in, in the day. And a bunch of folks got together in a room in Philadelphia and they designed this country. And they, they created some documents that, that have come down to us as the founding documents. But if you think about the founding uh, fathers as authors and um, the thing they created, the thing they authored, this creative act, was America. And what happened was the Declaration of Independence was actually designed to be read out loud in a kind of a flourishing rhetorical but sort of a muscular style that was very, in those days, kind of um, unorthodox. It wasn't in the highfalutin Latin. It was, la it was language that was meant to be heard and enjoyed by everybody. And following the Declaration of Independence uh, in, in that uh, late, early summer of 1776, copies were sent to all the colonies where they were read out loud. And so we had this kind of uh, un unprecedented public performance where people were reading this document, the Declaration of Independence, and in some of my workshops we actually read some of it out loud. The document was read out loud and it was a transformation. As people heard the words United States of America, all men are created equal, remember? Those are the, those are the words that, are, that I'm searching for. Well, up until that time, people were from the states. So if you ask somebody, well, where are you from? They said, well, I'm a Marylander or I'm a Massachusetts man, or I'm a, you know, I'm, a, I'm a Rhode Island man. But when they heard the words, we the people, all men are created equal, et cetera, et cetera, United States of America, something happened mentally. And now, instead of being from the singular states, we are from this thing called the United States of America, which didn't exist, right? Didn't, wasn't on any map, wasn't recognized by any foreign government. But because the founders created this document, was read out loud, and the audience heard the United States of America, and they go, oh yeah, that's where I'm from. I'm from the United States of America. In that minute, we created the United States of America in the minds of the listeners and the authors. So it was, it was a piece of political performance art that happened during the summer of 1776, the result of which a country was created from scratch, from nothing, from, a, from these 13 colonies, and now we're something called the United States of America. Now, if that's not an audacious act of creativity, I don't know what is. And remember, we're looking back from a point of view of being a done deal, but it was by no means a certainty what would have happened. Remember, we were going up against the empire, the, the world's mightiest army. Um, they hadn't lost, you know, they, they had uh, colonies all over the planet. I mean, it was audacious to say the least. And had the founding fathers and their allies been captured by the uh, British Army, they would have been hung as traitors. And uh, many of the people who signed the declaration, in fact, had their properties seized, and many ended up on the run and suffered great, great harm. Now, who was left out of the Declaration of Independence? African Americans, women, and Native Americans. Yeah, so it wasn't a perfect document, right? But, but here's the thing that I love about it. It's, it's a, was a work in progress. So that's, a, that's an image that's very familiar to the arts world. When you say something is a work in progress, it means it's not finished yet. It's perfectible. And what I like about America, um, amongst other things, is the fact that we are a work in progress. We haven't been there yet. We, we're not there yet, by any means. But we're on a road. And I think that's, that's a great image of, of, of co-creation. So we together as citizens are on a journey together to create America, to create your community, to create this this state to create this nation, that sense of collaborative creativity is, is I think, unique on the planet, in my opinion, okay? So that's, that's a long-winded way of explaining why I think creativity is a national value, that it's in our DNA, and that's why, as I say, 38 million people who are not born here are here today. By the way, is anybody here not born here? Yes, sir? Where are you from? Mexico. Mexico? Why are you here now? To get out, but to, to, to seek something better? Yes. 
Well, I tell you, I have this conversation with many, many people, and by and large, the answer boils down to opportunity. I mean, it, it could be my, my parents came here because the, the schools were not good were in the other country, or there was repression in the other country, or I couldn't practice my religion in the other country, or I, I couldn't get a job. I, my opportunity was blocked because they don't, you know, I was from the wrong caste or the wrong class. You know what I'm saying? For me, all that boils down to one word, opportunity. So we say, welcome, brother. You know, knock yourself out. I hope you're the next Bill Gates. You know? <laughs> you know? You don't think so? I'll do my best. You do your best. Well, maybe you, you know. But who knows? You, you can't, you, you don't know is the point. You don't know who the next Bill Gates is. You don't know who the next Louis Armstrong is. You don't know who the next Jonas Salk is. You know what I'm saying? Who's going to cure cancer or AIDS or solve some thorny issue. And, and, and I'm going to, I'll make you one bet, bet, it ain't going to look like me, <laughs> some old white guy. It's going to look like someone who, who, who doesn't look like me. And that's why you need, to, that's why creativity is, a, is I think, a positive force. It's, it's, a, it's a welcoming force. It says, give me, your new, give me new stuff. Bring it, to, bring it to me. I want new stuff. I, I want to explore. I want to try new things. And to me, that's, that's good for our democracy, but it's good for our economy. Like, so, okay, very long-winded reason, but I thought it's good to get that on the table. So next, creativity and democracy. I think you get where I'm coming from. It's a feedback loop. One feeds the other. The more creativity we have, the more questions we ask, the more democracy we have. The more democracy we have, the freer we are, the more likely you are to ask more questions. So therefore, we don't want to clamp down on your freedom of speech. We don't want to forbid your right to travel your right to associate, your right to learn. No, no one here is forcing you to take a class, right? So you say, well, I, okay, I want to take you know, social studies, so there are certain requirements, but no one forced you to be so, take social studies, right? So someone says, I'm tired of social studies, I want to go study economics. Well, go, that's down the hall, go study. We don't demand you to do it, but we don't punish you if you don't. You may make less money o over the course of your lifetime, but we say, what do you want to do? You want to study, you want to not study, you want to work, what do you want to do? Well, the more that we have of that, the more, the more dance we have back and forth between creativity and democracy. We must collaborate together on creating our history. So that's a very strong belief I have that'll be demonstrated by my, by, by my major stories that I'll be telling you in a second. And that is, um, we are not bystanders, ladies and gentlemen. We are active makers of history. That is my position. That is what I believe we should all be. We should all be active makers of history, not watchers, you know, sitting on the uh, couch potatoes, letting the bus go by. We must protect the commons. The commons is stuff that belongs to everybody and, and not to anyone in particular. The commons would be things like the air, the water, the internet, oddly enough, is a commons, um, uh, nature. <laughs> and uh, so things that belong to everybody that should be passed down from, from generation to generation in an unspoiled, in fact, expanded manner, that's the commons. And it's a concept that's in danger today with a trend towards privatization. Just coming down in, in the car, listening to the news, there was a whole long talk about it. I am vigorously against privatization. Uh, I think it's a very bad idea. It's a ripoff mostly to, to the people. So the commons is a subject that should be studied rigorously and, de and debated in our, in our public universities. Um, justice requires struggle. So like I said before, uh, we're not there yet. We are perfectible, but we're not perfect. And if you see something that you don't like, it's on you to do something about it. Things don't fix themselves. And, and just because something is wrong doesn't mean it's just going to take care of itself. Justice requires struggle. Remember, power concedes nothing without a demand. Prosperity and plenty are possible, but there are a lot of barriers. And it's the, it's the recognition and removal of those barriers that will get us to the better place. So that's where I come from. All right, so I'm going to tell you two stories. That'll, that'll take up the bulk of my time with you tonight. Uh, and these are two stories about um, how I work, and I think we'll try to tease from them these, these lessons for the outlier, the lessons for the change agent, and basically are one story of building something and one story of stopping something. Um, in the first case, I had no resources, and I created a big program from nothing. In the second, I had nothing, but we stopped a big program. So it's a kind of interesting mirror uh, lessons that I want to share with you. Okay, the first one is, how do the arts build communities? And it's 
the story of my work with People's Housing uh, back in 1993 through 95. That's three years. So People's Housing was a community development organization, and that's a nonprofit that's charged with building affordable housing and building communities that tend to be disinvested, um, have barriers placed before them, and uh, there are several thousand community development corporations, or sometimes you hear, you hear the phrase CDC, and they uh, build most of our affordable housing in America, uh, upwards of six to 700,000 units. Uh, and in Chicago, there are about, depending on when you look, between 30 and 40 of these organizations spread out all over the map in specific neighborhoods. So I went to work for one of them called People's Housing, and my job was to use the arts to develop the community. Interesting concept, not rehabbing buildings, but somehow using the arts to build opportunity. So this is People's Housing Service Area. It was in the upper northeast side of Chicago in an area called Rogers Park, a predominantly African-American community uh, with low to very low income families and right at the edge of Chicago. Uh, so our, People's Housing's main uh, product, if you were, were taking old crummy buildings and fixing them up and then moving people in. So these are buildings that might have been abandoned or crack houses in some cases, um, you know, eyesores, and we would acquire them and, 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 and put funding together and then fix them up and move families in. So here you can see uh, construction going on. We had 21 such properties with 600 families. We also did other things like a community garden and a senior center, and we brought in $22 million worth of capital to that tiny piece of Chicago uh, known as North Rogers Park. Now, this is where I come in. The organization acquired the Howard Theater, which was built in 19... 18 and hadn't been used in about 18 years. So by the time I got there, it was long, had disappeared off the map you know, of people's memories. But yet people, thousands of people walked by it every day. So my job was to somehow bring this thing back to life and use the arts to develop North Rogers Park somehow. So here you can see it's a quite a, a nice facility. It's you know, really uh, beautiful, a lot of uh, interesting historic uh, an architecture. There's an old advertisement from the years before. The floor plan um, was quite generous, but um, the actual theater itself was unsafe, and so it was, we couldn't use it. But we ended up using the lobby. So the lobby is the uh, area directly in front, 4,000 square feet right there. And so that's where we operated. So one of the things that, that you want to make a note of as I'm blowing through these stories is, you know, sort of tips. So here's a tip being inventive, right? So we couldn't use the main space. Spa main space was unsafe, locked up. But look, the lobby. Well, whoever thought of putting a theater in the lobby? That's a crazy idea. Well, 4,000 square feet. That's bigger than a lot of theaters. So we built a little stage in the lobby, up against the, the doors, so people walked down the street, they could actually see uh, the performers standing on the stage with their backs to the street, so to speak. And we put a speaker on the street, so anything said, everything being said on, in the stage would actually be broadcast on the street, so you have instant street advertising. So be inventive, think different. So we took a grassroots, fun approach to building this program with no money. Um, the first thing we did was we needed chairs, so we did a spare chair day, and we, lo we advertised this locally in the paper and distributed flyers. We basically said, show up on such and such a Saturday with chairs. And we had over 100 chairs. So people came in with their lawn chairs, their comfy chairs, their, <laughs> their ottomans. And in one half hour, we had the chairs to fill the theater up. And everyone had their name on it. So that's, I thought, was a you know, pretty fun idea. And people were cleaning the chairs. So it became a community event. We had food. People were scrubbing chairs out in the street, turning them in, labeling them. And, you know, that night we were able to have an event. The approach we used was something called a ca capacity building model. So for those of you that are interested in community organizing or community planning or social work, this is a term that you should be familiar with. It's coined by John Crutzman and Dr. John McKnight of Northwestern University. And they, um, it's about looking at the positive assets in a community, no matter how bad off it is or how but a bad reputation it is. It's always positive things in that community, and this model takes note of those things. So what am I talking about? Um, a community is rich uh, array of assets, which include people, talents, places, and associations. So all of those are assets that are to be used for the betterment of that community, for the building of that community. 
and, but they need to be recognized, uh, categorized, and sort of found. Like, like, a, like think of it as like a, a scavenger hunt or a treasure hunt. You're in a community that has a lot of problems. Everybody's always talking about this community. It's got a lot of this and drunken people and drugs or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever the bad rap for the community is. But it also has a bunch of positive, great stuff that always doesn't get um, recognized. So this is a, this is a, a tool that you can use to, to see. This shows you the associations. Uh, you can see physical spaces. You can imagine what, what kinds of spaces, parks, schools, uh, the local economy, individuals, institutions. All these things are stuff to, are your building blocks if you're trying to improve your community. And so that's what we did. We, we embarked on this kind of exercise. We administered this questionnaire uh, this questionnaire was designed by some of our, our residents in our buildings, and it was d designed to be administered on the street to find out who had what talent. So the first page was kind of a marketing survey. Hey, we're, we're, we're going to be renovating this Howard Theater, turning it into a community center. What would, you, what would you like to see? Would you like to see theater? Would you like to see dance? You know, those, those kinds of marketing questions. How much would you pay, et cetera? But then the, the secret, the real reason for the survey is we turned the page over, and then we said, what can you do? And now the person is, is thinking arts. They're thinking, I just answered a bunch of questions about would I like to see dance. So the first response was, oh, I can't do any of that. In other words, I, I'm not creative in the way you're speaking of. And then the, the person giving the survey would say, yeah, yeah, but, but, but look at the questions. You ch check, check off these. And there's over 30 items here, things like cooking, knitting, card playing, magic tricks, woodworking, singing. And you know what I'm saying? Those kinds of things. And people are going, oh, yeah, I can do that. Oh, yeah, I do that. I do that. I sing in the choir. Oh, yeah, I'm really good with, you know. And they, next thing you know, they checked off five or six things. So, so excuse me, madam, did you say you weren't creative? You just checked off six things. Oh, you know. So it's, 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 it's um, that kind of exercise is empowering. So now people are realizing, I have stuff. I have assets. Then we ask them, well, would you like to do that in our new creative center? Would you like to teach that? Would you like to sell things? Would you like to take classes in the things that you are eligible? Well, then people would say, yeah, I, I would like to do that. So valuable information. We administered this questionnaire for about 1,000 people, which is about 3% of the entire population. It's a lot of, it's a, it's a good sample. And that information helped us to build our program. We unearthed community talent. People said, oh yeah, my, fa you know, my father is this, or my brother is a, or I play the sam saxophone, or I'm a poet, or I'm, we found all kinds of things in the community that came to play in this program. The Howard Theater itself, as you see, uh, eventually we got <laughs> funky chairs from a, from a, a, a nunnery, actually. Uh, they were all bright yellow. It looked like from the Brady Bunch. Uh, there was also a space above the lobby that was a ballroom that we used for dances and community events. So we had lots of great spaces. As you see, we used the front of this theater as well as uh, a nearby field. So here's some examples of the programs that we built over a few years. Again, using people from the neighborhood and uh, some of the artists that I knew. We had the all ages open mic. Very, very popular. Kids love to express themselves. If any of you ever work with kids and you're looking for something to do, open mic, you'll, you have to beat them off with sticks. Uh, here you see again performances. Kids love to get on the mic, but we also train kids to work the mics. So we're training kids in technical skills. So now we had people understanding how to, how to lay to cable, how to mix, how to uh, do the, the behind the scenes work that is often overlooked. So everybody thinks they want to get on the, on the microphone and be the next MC Hammer or whatever, or Snoop Dogg or what have you, but they don't realize that for every one performer, there's 90 people behind the stage, there's 90 people working in marketing and legal and production and you know what I'm saying? And we were training people in that direction. So here's an example of what happened here. We started with the all ages open mic. It became a weekly event that led to a writing class. The writing class led to a newspaper. The kids published their own newspaper and they were paid for their beats. The uh, open mic led to a talent show, which led to a TV show, which led to a recording album. All that flowed just from our willingness to try stuff. So another tip that I would put down is experiment and iterate. Iterate. Try things. You don't know what's going to succeed. A good community organizer always starts where the people are. So I had no pre-notion of, of any of this stuff. This was all explored with the people, real time. What do they want to do? When we found this open mic was successful, we just went with it, built on it, built on it, and built on it. 
It wasn't Tom Tresser saying everybody's got to go to the open mic. It was the community telling Tom Tresser, we want this and we want more of it. We had festivals, we had a drumming festival, family festival, dance festivals, all kinds of festivals. People loved to come out and recreate and we exposed them to the arts of the community. They were, the, North Howard Street is a very rich community with um, Caribbean folk and African American, Latino. So we try to mix them all together through the arts. So the arts is another strategy to bring people together that aren't used to being together. We have a drumming class. The drumming class led to an ensemble that I got booked down to Navy Pier. So these kids, after taking a couple of classes, were so good that they, they were getting paid good money to, to drum down at Navy Pier. We had a tile making business. So you can see some of these beautiful three-dimensional tiles made by our kids. So we started getting installation jobs. Again, businesses that spring from the arts and, and the entertainment fields. There's the album recorded by Gregory Crook. You see him over in the upper uh, right of your screen. Gre Gregory had the gear in his living room. So all this was recorded right, you know, five minutes away from the theater because he had this stuff in his living room. And so um, the youngest performers on the album were 12 and the oldest, well, I don't know how old Mrs. Jones was, but she is a grandma and she sang um, God Bless the Children, old school, okay? And so we had a wide range of, of talent on the, on the album and the kids sold the album. So they, again, were learning about marketing and sales. Um, drum classes, etc. storytelling. Does anybody watch Deaf Poetry Jam? There's a, one of the performers is Malik Youssef, and he's went on to win a Grammy. He's worked with Kanye and Common, but there he is in 1994 on stage at the People's House, People's Housing Arts Program. He's got two tracks on the album. So this is kind of the model. Uh, we found the artist, we agreed on a project. Um, I had control of the space. So I, I, I didn't have to ask anyone's permission. We set up a trial run. If it was unsuccessful, no harm done. If the trial run of the project was successful, then we went on and found more marketing and more support for the artist. Then we said, well, can we make it into a business? If the answer was no, it just continued on in a, as, an as an educational program. But if it could be a business, then we actually uh, did some seed fund and turned the project into a business. So there was sort of an evolution of, of what I would call social creative venture capital. So that's the model that we created at, at People's Housing. Again, always starting from where the people were, what were those assets in the community, and you just built on them. My role was kind of like a Johnny Appleseed character or banker, if you will, hoping, and, hoping, increasing, making it known that we were there. So someone would come to me and say, hey, Tom, I want to teach a jewelry class. Have you ever done jewelry class? No, but you know, showed me all their jewelry. Obviously, they know what they're doing. Okay, I'm going to trust you. We'll, you'll have two sessions. We'll put the flyers out in the community. We'll see how you do. The person is a crappy jewelry teacher. Well, so we wasted 100 bucks. But the person has got fire and is, works well with the kids. The next thing you know, they're all making stuff. Then we try to find a market for the jewelry. And you know, we had farmers markets. We had our dances. We had our cultural events. So we had our own built-in market for these things, and we would offer them. If things went, went, went well, then we said, okay, let's turn it into a real business. So that's the model. The operating principles were, you know, we start where the people are, we seduced and recruited local artists. So that's another thing that you're gonna find useful, you know, in, in this work, your ability to persuade and inspire. <laughs> so I'm pretty good at that. So I get excited about a project, and I'm able to sell it. I'm able to talk about it with passion and conviction, and people go, oh, okay, I'll try it. And so that's kind of what I did. I went to about 100 meetings. You know, what I didn't show you were all the, the, the places I went with my, my, with my, my presentations and my, my little models, you know, telling people all over North Howard Street, all in, all in the Rogers Park about this project and why they should help and why they should come. And oftentimes people were saying, well, thank you very much. We have to move on. And that was the end of it. But oftentimes people would go, hey, that's great. I want to be part of it. So being able to be a good salesman and a good ambassador, very important. We leveraged our, math, our mastery of space. So that's something that was unique to people's housing. You may not have that luxury if you're working in communities or you're trying to create something. You may not have the space that I had, but space creates action. So if you have the ability to be in a nice space, there's a certain magic to having a space. It's a storefront, a, a location. I can't emphasize the importance of having a space when you're trying to create work in this way. You make the path by walking it. 
Now that's kind of how I live my life. My wife, on the other hand, can't stand. She wants to have the path paved, lit. You know what I'm saying? You know, 13 miles to the next rest stop. But we make a good team, she and I. But I, I tend to just boldly go where nobody has gone before. And sometimes I bump into a wall and I bruise myself. Uh, or I step off the edge and, you know, have to climb back up. But that's me. But you make the path by walking it. I listen, learn, and lead. So that's my style that I, I, I found useful in my work. Before you open your mouth, you listen. You seek to understand before you're understood. I think St. Francis might have said that. Um, so you do a lot of listening, a lot of learning, but then at some point you've got to get out in front, okay, here's where we're going to go. And that was, that was my role at People's Housing. Iteration, quick starts, using seed funds. That's, again, the model that People's Housing uh, found very useful in making these little programs over and over. By the time People's Housing, uh, unfortunately, went out of business after three years of, of me being there, um, they just had suffered a lot of financial setbacks. I had seven artists working for me with a budget of $250,000, and we were serving about 12,000 people a year from nothing. But it was, it was through following these, these steps. All right, now, I will completely shift my gears and tell you now a story of how we stopped something big from happening. First story was how we started something from scratch with very little resources. Now the story of how we stopped something big that had a lot of resources, whereas we had none. I told story of the Chicago 2016 Olympic effort. First of all, who here wanted the Olympics to come to Chicago? Who here did not want the Olympics to come to Chicago? Who here are indifferent? Doesn't matter to them. So it's about a third, a third, and a little bit of, a little bit of pro Olympics. All right. Well, set the stage. The the mayor, Mayor Daly, really wanted the games. He wanted them in the worst way, and the, old, the entire city was was turned out for it. As you can see, a vast array of players supported the bid. Uh, business community. Pat Ryan, the head of Aon Insurance, former head of Aon Insurance. The mayor, of course, was his project. The former governor, the, uh, he was running for president at the time, and then, he, of course, he became president, uh, President Obama, big backer of the, of the games. Here he is at the, at the White House. And Oprah, let's not forget her, she really, really liked the games. So against all that, we had no game Chicago. So the first thing I want to call to your attention in our sort of ongoing tips and tools is logo. So notice the logo. This was a designed piece of work. It uses the colors of the city. So if, if those of you who know the city know the, that, that blue color is associated with the city on the flag, right? The four stars are part of the city iconography. And it said, there's our website. And you know we wanted better housing, better schools, better um, mass transit, better clinics. So we were saying no, but we, we were also saying you got to say no to the bad things so you can get, have the good things. But the, but the name of our organization was No Game Chicago. We were a diverse group of social justice activists. We were from all over the city. We were all volunteers. Nobody got paid. We were funded by no one. Uh, this was a radioactive issue. Nobody would touch this issue in the city of Chicago. Nobody would talk about it or interrogate it in any meaningful manner. Our first event was a public forum at the University of Illinois in Chicago, January 31st, 2009, attended by about 250 people. So why we opposed the games? Well, because they would have bankrupted the city. The London games, which are going to be done in 2012, are $9 billion over budget. Uh, Vancouver, which just held the games, the city folk there are on the hook for about a billion dollars, and the winter games are much smaller than the summer games. They would have destroyed public parks, since most of the venues were slated to be put in our parks, including the historic Washington Park, that had been obliterated, but also many other parks would have been damaged beyond uh, recognition, of course, disrupting those communities uh, very seriously. They would have displaced poor and working class families from neighborhoods around the venues. This is traditionally true uh, for what happens when the games come to town. And many in the uh, African-American communities around Douglas Park and Washington Park were very cognizant of the ongoing uh, move to gentrify them and move them out of their long-held neighborhoods 
and developers and speculators were already circling around those areas like vultures and, um, and th the pressure was already on a year, you know, even before the games were even awarded, speculation was rampant in those communities and longtime activists were dreadfully afraid of what would happen when the games came to town. But then from the, for those people who are interested in, in independent politics, there was another reason to oppose the games and that is because the way Chicago politics works is, you know, when big projects are awarded, there's always kickbacks to the machine, to the mayor and his allies. And this, because this would have been billions of dollars worth of contracts, it would have been tens of millions of kickbacks that we believe would have found their way into the mayor's political coffers. So that means anyone running against the mayor or against any of his cronies or allies for the next 20 years would have been, a, would have been found their, their race impossible because their, the, the, uh, the, the machine candidates would have been flush with Olympic kickback cash. It's already hard enough to challenge someone in the Democratic Party in Chicago. Let me tell you, I know from firsthand, had the games come to town, it would have been the end of democracy as, I, as we know it. Pretty dramatic statement, but that's, that's kind of how we believed it. So we did all the research that no one else would do. Uh, we went deep into the literature. We talked to people from other cities. We looked at studies, um, with, again, with no staff, but just is there, independent volunteers just doing the research to find out what has happened in the past, what do we know from the record. And we found out the, the things that made, made uh, us be very alarmed. Uh, so, you know, Vancouver's bond rating was lowered, the city was facing bankruptcy. Um, and when you, when you lie about your finances and disguise expenses to make your project look better, we call that Enron accounting. So we felt that the 2016 committee and the city of Chicago was accused of Enron accounting, and that got press. When we, when we backed that statement up with our evidence, that gave us credibility, that people are saying, well, where's your documentation? And we'll say, well, here it is. So another tip is do deep research. If you're doing this kind of work, you better be, better, you better be really well prepared. And it doesn't matter if you don't have a staff and the other guy has a staff. The, the mayor has a big staff. 2016 committee raised almost $80 million. They had a big staff. Some of those folk were making $400,000 a, a year. But you have to be as well prepared and able to, to box with your opponent uh, regardless. And so we did the deep research that gave us the credibility to speak before the media uh, and, and the media then started to seek us out. We engaged the community. So there's that first meeting that I mentioned on January 31st. Uh, that was the first public forum, if you can believe it. In, in, in a project as big as the Olympics, there had been no kind of hands-on you know, meeting where you had the pros and the cons discussed. But we had a, a number of speakers from human rights, from housing, from education, all talking about why the games are not good. And there you, you can see the results. We had a rally on April 3rd, shut down the bid, and that coincided with the arrival of the Olympic evaluation team. So 13 people from the Olympics uh, came to Chicago to look at this, the venues, and they were given the royal treatment. We met them with 500 people in Federal Plaza saying, we don't want the games. They're not appropriate for the city. We have other priorities. We need better schools. We need better mass transit. We need better clinics. We don't need a $10 billion party seven years from now. That's not what's, what is required. We marched, as you can see, uh, from the Federal Plaza to the headquarters of the, uh, of the uh, 2016 committee. That's one of my favorite uh, signs that someone made <laughs> in sort of the Olympic rings. No BS. Teachers came out. Community members came out. Different groups came out and we were on the map. Later in the summer, the 2016 committee felt beset by the, our opposition and they felt they had to go to all 50 wards with a dog and pony show saying why the games were great and why, uh, why, we, why we would benefit from them. We weren't allowed to pass literature out in those meetings. They were, they were heavily policed, even though many of them were in public property. But eventually we just sort of wore them down and were able to pass out literature and hold up signs. But at every one of those meetings, we were there and passing out literature and people were asking tougher and tougher questions as the summer wore on. There you can see <laughs> uh, from one of the meetings uh, later in the summer. On September 29th, we held a second rally outside of Silly Hall, City Hall. Uh, and while they were doing that, you can see the audacity of Nope, 
That's one of my favorite signs. That led us to, to being the, the only group that was giving the negative information about the Olympics, or the, the unvarnished truth, shall we say, which led to dozens and dozens of media appearances. So in a situation like this, now you have to be not just uh, well-researched, but you have to be kind of um, telegenic. <laughs> you have to know how to work the media, and not everyone can do that. Uh, Francesca Rodriguez is, is a master's student in public policy at the University of Chicago. She'd never done anything like this. And yet, all of a sudden, she found herself on television and on radio talking cogently in short bursts. Remember, people have such short attention spans that not only do you have to be smart about your subject matter and, and vocal, but you have to be able to do it in little tiny bites. And that takes work. There I am on Chicago Tonight. There's Bob on, a, on another news station. Bob is one of the co-founders of No Games. And so we did that for, for quite a while. We did our own press releases. So now we're into communication strategy. Every social change effort has to have a communication strategy. What's your message? Who are you trying to reach with the message? Now here's where we, here's a, here's a dirty little secret that I don't even think the mayor and his people have figured out yet. But the No Game Chicago volunteers were better communicators than the city itself was. We were able to communicate our position more effectively than the 2016 bid committee was able to communicate. And we were, to, we were able to do this because we figured out our public was the IOC members. So we, we, did, we, we figured it out. This, this was our strategic insight. What we did is we realized that on October 2nd, there was going to be an election in Copenhagen where 102 people, members of the IOC, were going to essentially vote on the future of our city. Get the games, not get the games. A simple, straight-up vote, majority rules. And our job was to influence this election and the voters of which lived all over the planet, 23 of which were members of the royalty. I'm ta I kid you not. His Royal Highness, such and such, her pr princess of, of whatever, the, the, the Prince of Orange, the Duke of Orange. These are real people, titled nobility, we're gonna sit in, in judgment of our city. And we had to somehow per persuade them to our point of view, and we were successful. So some of the tools that we used were um, uh, an email tool called uh, Constant Contact. So now you get a little micro, but, but you, you have to have a method of communicating your message. And we used video, YouTube, websites, emailing, this is an example of a newsletter, an email newsletter that was sent to the members of the IOC every day for 70 days prior to the decision. So the decision was on October 2nd. So 70 days before that, starting on July 23rd, I believe it was, the IOC members received one email with one tidbit of information that backed up our arguments on why Chicago was unfit to host the games. Um, and it was couched not in his editorial, like this is what Tom thinks or what Someone such thing. This is just from the, today's papers. We're just passing this along because we're, we know you need to know. As a result, by September 2nd, this is what happened. The support had plummeted. When a poll like this had been done several months before, the support for the games was at 67%. And what this told us was that the more people found out about this mess, the less they liked it. 84% of the people said, we don't want to pay under, under no circumstances. So that fact was communicated to the IOC, like that. So we created a postcard and mailed it to the IOC. And um, it was very effective. We actually sent a delegation to Switzerland, the first time that that's ever happened. So again, thinking audaciously, thinking creatively, thinking like I don't know, even know how we're gonna do this, but we're gonna do this. Um, basically, three of us went to Switzerland to deliver our materials to the IOC and I ended up putting it on my credit card, and, and the group said, we'll just find a way to pay you back. You know, like we'll hold fundraisers, we'll, you know, we'll get small donations, and that's in fact what happened. So it was a huge leap of faith, but it paid off. So we went to Switzerland, we, developed, we delivered 100 copies of what we call the Book of Evidence, which was reprints from newspapers uh, over the last four years on how corrupt Chicago is, how broke we are, how incompetent we are, how our mass transit is in incapable of moving people around, let alone a million, you know, visitors from the Olympics. And now basically the people of Chicago did not want this party. 
And again, dozens of articles backing that, those up. So it wasn't just me mouthing off, it was hundreds of articles. We delivered those to the IOC's headquarters um, in mid-June of last year and it was a cause of sensation. Um, it was like Madonna showing up at a, at a rock club. I mean, they, we were swarmed by the media uh, because all four cities were in, were in, was in uh, Lausanne making their presentations. So the, bid, the 2016 committee was there and the other three cities, Madrid, Rio, and Tokyo, all had delegations. So all the press from all those cities were there and we were right in the middle of all that. So there, there we are delivering our boxes to the headquarters of the IOC. And <laughs> here's uh, from Tokyo, from Japan, you know, um, and it made the news all across the world. The next day at the Museum uh, Olympique, where the four host cities were making, the four finalist cities were making their presentations, we showed up yet again, and we set up a newsstand, delivering our pieces of evidence, our books, to the press, to the members of the other delegations, again, causing a sensation. We used YouTube and handheld video cameras. So Martin Macias, who is a youth organizer, uh, was one of our delegates. And so this is a um, update that he gave from uh, the shores of Lake Geneva, where he explained what, what No Games was doing, and what, would happen, what had happened that day. So we used the internet extensively in real time, updating uh, people in Chicago even as these things were happening, we used Twitter and Facebook as well. The same delegation went to Copenhagen, as I alluded to, uh, on October 2nd. There we are again. There's ABC Evening News. Again, nobody had ever done this before. Nobody had ever, no, no citizens had ever gone to, into the Olympic furnace to say, no, thank you. Our position was that the, that the mayor and even the president of the United States were not speaking for the citizens of Chicago, that they were out of touch. We again used uh, Facebook and YouTube to, to do updates. And so on, uh, on YouTube, there are a number of these videos, you know, three to five minutes of updating people on what we were doing, how we were, you know, how we were being received. And the challenge was n now to deliver our materials, which were press releases and more letters, into the hands of the IOC. But this time, unlike, unlike in Switzerland, we had the Army, the police, the American Secret Service, and Mayor Daly's private security force were all protecting the hotels where we needed to go. And somehow, and I don't want to tell you how, but we bluffed our way past them, past all these guards to deliver our materials, which included some of these materials. This is, this is actual copies of what we handed to the IOC. And there you see, actually at the moment of handing off the materials in the hotel, <laughs> and on the way out, we posed with the Army. All right, so now on the day of the decision, the president touches down an Air Force One, and it's very dramatic. It was drizzly. He goes on his way to the Bella Center with his motorcade. And again, we felt the entire force of America, you know, the, the weight of the government, the weight of Chicago, the weight of the president himself, was behind this bad policy, and it was just us three people. It was very exhausting and, and, and sort of depressing, and we didn't know how it was going to go. But we'd done our best, we felt, for what we felt was right. There, uh, you can see the pomp and circumstances of, of, of each city making its final pitch. That happened that morning of, April, of October 2nd. And there I am watching Jacques Rogue, the president of the International Olympic Committee, uh, read the results of the first vote, which happened at about 11 o'clock-ish, our local time. And it was seven hours different, so it was late in the afternoon, I think, in Chicago. And Chicago was eliminated on the first vote. 18 votes out of the, I think, the 97 people who were present. Uh, total surprise. The conventional wisdom that we were, we were, we were either going to get the games outright or it was certainly would be between us and Rio. But everyone was wrong. Um, it wasn't the case at all. As you can see, the people in Chicago were disappointed and shocked. And then a few hours later, the winning city was announced, Rio de Janeiro. Across the street from where all this was happening in Copenhagen, where all these, where all these things were announced in a giant plaza, there was a Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum. This is what was behind my head when we were hearing all this. <laughs> so it's like surreal, believe it or not. And so headlines around the world and at home. And on the day of the decision, the web, tra web traffic for our, our site spiked to about 11,000 people visited our website that day. But we also decided as good organizers, if the decision went our way, the decision that we hoped it would go, what then? We didn't want to just leave it at that. So we actually were prepared for two polls. We had two polls prepared for our website. One said, Chicago gets the games. Now what? The other said, Chicago does not get the games. 
Now what? Basically, we were asking our followers and supporters, what do you think should happen for Chicago for equitable economic development that would reach all the neighborhoods? What should happen for our politics? If you don't like the way things are going, well, what should we do? Well, three quarters of the uh, about 800 people who took the survey and, and gave us their feedback said fight. And they told us basically in no uncertain terms, fight. Keep going. Don't stop. We like what you're doing. You stood up to the power. You spoke truth to power. You won. Don't go away. A no game Chicago, as I said, was we didn't have an office. We didn't have any infrastructure. We had only the things that I told you about. So we weren't able to hold ourselves together. And everybody went back to their lives. So all the people that had work or they were involved in other activism, they went returned to those, including myself. Except for in my case, I took the advice to heart and I am now running for office. <laughs> so I am the Green Party candidate for Cook County Board President in the November general election of 2010. So that's my story, um, how, we, how we started something from scratch and how we stopped something from scratch.